and you see the same thing happening over and over again. Uh, there's a trade-off that I think everybody has to understand, and that bring, that's related to the second. With the large wealth gaps and and large, not enough money in lots of places, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury were put into a position of needing to get checks out. And there's also this left-right conflict issue having to do with the wealth gap. And that means that you have fiscal policy that are now requiring lots of spending. And so the question is really, um, are the consequences of not doing that better or worse than the consequences of doing that? Now, when we look from an investor's point of view or an individual's point of view, we have to remember that you can't raise living standards by just creating money and credit. Uh, particularly if you don't raise productivity more than that. And that means that those asset prices are going up. So we're in the phase of the cycle, very classic, that the financial asset prices have gone up because you've given them more money, that demand is going up, and now we're having inflation, inflation of those assets. So if a lot of that buying power is going to be pulled back, particularly as we go into the next year. But there's still going to be a lot and there's still going to be a high level of inflation of, of those types of assets. So the trade off is always the question. Right. OK, so quickly, where do you come out on that trade off? Is it a binary? Yes or no? Um, it's a it's a reflection of the state of where we are in the cycle that we have borrowed. It's all the problems that we've gotten ourselves into by acquiring too much debt and um, spending more than we're earning rather than being more productive and also not distributing the opportunities and the incomes in a way that it's a broad-based prosperity. So on the one hand, you have um, a, a prosperity that uh, the bottom 60% of the population isn't participating in very much. And at the same time, you have, um, so it's creating that polarity, and at the same time, you have the financial markets. So those are trade-offs that, um, you know, different people, the only care thing I care about is whether we're productive, whether we increase the size of the pie through productivity, and then divide it well, so that you create the something closer to equal opportunity that produces greater political stability and also draws on the population going wide. And the reason I say that is because I've studied these empires, these dynasties going back um, since the last 500 years. And you see the same thing happening over and over again. When there's a financial problem, when the granaries are empty and the coffers are empty, they print money. And when they print money and the coffers are empty, it devalues money. And with that, when you have a large gap of people at each other's throats, then you create a, a risk of an internal conflict, a risk of some kind of civil war. And that is what I think is, um, is we're at risk of. Yeah, I want to get to that um, polarization in one sec, but just quickly on inflation rate, how concerned are you about it? Um, I'm significantly concerned about it uh, because uh, the amount of money and credit that has to be produced right. and is budgeted um, is a large increase. And yet, if it's not spent, it produces its own problems. The markets have a sensitivity to that. So what, what it means, and then there's a supply demand picture for bond. And the way it looks is if you should get the selling of bond, it worsens that supply demand picture because the way it works is the treasury borrows and runs a deficit, but it can't produce money. So it has to sell bonds. And when it sells bonds, um, if there are not enough buyers of those bonds, then the Federal Reserve got to come in and print money and buy those bonds. And the world right now is over um, uh, uh, invested in US dollar denominated bonds, uh, pension funds on the 60-40 mix, or and they have negative real returns. And cash has a lot of negative real returns. So if there was a selling of that and a moving to other assets, stocks, um, other assets, um, commodities, other assets, mm -hmm. or other places, other currencies, other um, real estate and the like, that selling worsens the supply demand picture. And then if there's not enough demand, 
That means that the central bank has got to come in and print more money. So yes, it's not only the potent, the, the inflation that's in the pipeline or projected in that supply demand balance, but it's also what it could be if there's a selling of debt instruments. So we're printing too much money? Uh, too, we're, it's going to produce in, inflation, if that's what you're saying. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Okay. Let, let's go to the second trend you identify in well, declining empires, internal unrest. You write that wealth inequality often leads to the rise of populism and division. How bad have the divisions gotten in the U.S. and what's most to blame for that? Well, I think people around us, we all see it. Um, January 6th was um, just a simple, um, but history has shown when the causes that people are behind are more important to them than the system, the system is in jeopardy. And what we're seeing is um, not a, a, a classic uh, wealth gap caused by, uh, accompanied by political gap. So you're seeing um, that the left is more left and the right is more right. And you're seeing the conflicts within the parties. In the primary elections, you're going to see in each party a competition between the moderates and the more extreme. And, and you're, so you're seeing that dynamic uh, play out. You're seeing questioning of election results and questioning of, of rules. So you're getting to the point, something like 15% of, um, I forgot whether it was Democrats or Republicans, uh, wish the other member of the party would die and 10% uh, of the other party wish they would die. They don't want their children to marry other members of the party. So there's a question of even how um, rules will be followed. And so there's going to be a conflict. And I think it's not an exaggeration to say that you could see in the 2024 elections that no side will lose that, that and accept loss. That, and you're seeing the movement to different states related to different values. These types of things have never happened before. But in my book and my study that I did to understand them over time, they happen repeatedly through history. So I'm not just looking at what's happening today, but I'm finding that that pattern follows a very classic pattern that's repeated throughout history, which is the tendency of the middle to disappear and that you have to pick a side and you have to fight for that side. And that's the dynamic that is what I think is going on in following the classic dynamic that's shown in the book to have happened repeatedly. You write that the U.S. has a 30% chance of devolving into a civil war within the next 10 years. What would cause that to happen and who would be responsible for that? Well, let me clarify what I mean. Um, what I mean is um, that fighting over the rules, it doesn't mean necessarily shooting each other, although you, you could see much more violence. Um, it means um, that the rules of the system, that democracy by rule of law and the deferring to what the rules are, for example, to settle elections or settle issues, I think that that could be largely lost. I think, for example, like they had sanctuary cities, you could see situations in which the federal government would give mandates that would not be followed by the state government. And the, and then there's a question of who, how you, um, you just have uh, power and who has what power. And I think that you're going to see a lot more um, tested through the legal system and then maybe even beyond that they won't accept uh, those rules. And then that's a threat to our democracy because the the great thing of our democracy is that um, the following the rules, believing in it. I and mean, we've seen repeatedly where a presidential candidate might have the majority, but they said there's uh, vote, electoral votes and it comes down to that. And then they would say, well, for the greater good, we will agree on how that works. That's a remarkable following of the rules that our system's dependent on. And I think that almost anybody looking at the situation 
would say that there is um, some significant probability that might not work as well. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn 500,000, 1 million dollar, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.